the Yangtze River Delta, China's most developed region. During the Three Kingdoms period, this place was under control of the state of Wu. The historical account of the Three Kingdoms period, records of the Three Kingdoms, says that in 195, the warlord Sun Tu occupied the Jiangdong region, dispatching General Sun Hu to garrison Jingkou, modern-day Jinjiang, in Jiangsu. After Sun Quan, Sun Tu's younger brother, became ruler of Wu, he continued to govern this place, building the famous Tiawang city at the foot of the Begu Mountain. Tia Wung, therefore, can be regarded as the first city that Sun Quan governed. Gu Ye Wang, a historian from the Southern Song Dynasty, wrote in his book on geography that this city was built by Sun Quan, Emperor of Wu. With the Begu Mountain behind, Tia Wung was carefully planned so as to take maximum advantage of its location, becoming a formidable stronghold. Although not yet emperor, Sun Quan's city acquired the status of a capital. Much later, Emperor Kang Shi of the Qing Dynasty extolled the city in a poem, remarking that whoever controlled Tia Wung controlled all of Wu. In 208, Sun Quan moved the political center from Suzhou to Tia Wung in Zhenjiang. That year, the most famous battle of the Three Kingdoms period occurred, the Battle of Chu Bi, or the Battle of Red Cliff, in which Liu Bei and Sun Quan joined forces to fight Chao Chao. According to Attack Wu Lin, a Wu state battle song, Chao Chao had suppressed the Wu Huan people and conquered Jing Zhou. Now, with 100,000 ships and chariots, he was about to sail downriver to deal with his other enemies. All that stood between him and victory was the state of Wu. Thanks to Sun Quan's inspired leadership, General Zhou Yu and Cheng Pu stopped Chao Chao at Ulin. This song was written by Wei Zhao, a senior minister and historian of the Wu state. He compiled the Book of Wu, which provided Chen Shou with a lot of detailed historical materials when he came to write Records of the Three Kingdoms. The Battle of Ulin, which he mentioned in the song, would eventually come to be known as the Battle of the Red Cliff. One of the most famous engagements in Chinese military history, the Battle of the Red Cliff, has become an object lesson in how a weaker side can destroy a stronger one. Decisive, large-scale, the Battle of the Red Cliff pitted the combined forces of warlords Liu Bei and Sun Quan against the numerically superior forces of Chao Chao. In spring of 208, in order to ready his waterborne forces for the coming southern campaign, Chao Chao dug Xuan Yu Lake in Ye Cheng. 
It was round about this time that Liu Bei secured the services of Zhuge Liang after paying him three visits, and Sun Quan annihilated Huang Zhu, avenging his father's death. Just as Sun Quan was preparing to attack Liu Biao, Cao Cao led his army southwards. Then Liu Biao, the governor of Jingzhou, suddenly started vomiting blood and died. Shocked, his son Liu Chong surrendered, giving in without a fight. But it was a close run thing. If Zhao Yun had not rescued Liu Shan and his mother, and Zhang Fei had not frightened away the pursuers at the Damyang Bridge, Liu Bei's family might have all been killed by Cao Cao's 5,000 elite cavalrymen. But Cao Cao's occupation of Zhang Ling was a grave cause for concern for Wu. Now he had control of Jingzhou's navy. The state of Wu could no longer hide behind the natural barrier of the Yangtze. Just as panic set in Hu, Sun Quan received a taunting letter from Cao Cao. Now I have a million sailors. I would like to go hunting with you in the state of Wu. Chu 当然孙权要想着和曹操联合一国就是卢秀一国就是周玉这两国人就是卷起主张抵抗周瑜讲了一句什么话呢?他说曹操是汉贼,所以我们要打他,这是个政治宣言。Zhou Yu was a military general of the Wu state at the time. Lu Su was warlord Sun Quan's follower. While Cao Cao was coming at the Wu state, Sun Quan hesitated. Should he fight on or give up the fight? Chang Chao and other advisors advised him to throw in the towel and surrender to Chao Chao. At this critical moment, one that would decide his fate and change history, Zhou Yu and Lu Su prompted him to make up his mind to carry on the fight against Chao Chao to the death. More than that, According to Zhou Yu, there was very hope of success. Convinced, Sun Quan pulled out his broadsword and cut the table in front of him in two. Pointing to the table, from now on he said, anyone who mentioned the word surrender would end up like the table. By this point, Cao Cao had already crossed the Yangtze River and its waterborne forces were about to get a very nasty surprise at the Red Cliff. Cao Cao, as we all know, was defeated in this encounter. Forced to withdraw north, the river was once again a natural barrier between him and the allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei. Not used to fighting on the river, Cao Cao's army opted to link up their ships and boats and make them into a pontoon so that the main body of the army could cross. Meanwhile, Zhou Yu adopted General Huang Gai's strategy of fire attack and deceived Cao Cao's troops with a feint. In winter 208, it was chilly on both sides of the Yangtze. Mm. 
On the day of the decisive battle, the northwest wind suddenly turned into a southeast wind. The wind blew from the red cliff on the southeast bank of the Yangtze River to Wu Lin, where Chow Chow's camp was located. That night, General Huang Gai led warships of different sizes towards Wu Lin with a fair wind. But rather than surrendering as Chow Chow had thought, Huang Gai's ships were on fire. Fanned by the wind, the fires grew in intensity, spreading to Chow Chow's vessels and the forts established on land. Chow Chow was left with no choice but to burn his remaining ships and order his army to retreat. Sun Yuan Yan, a poet of the late Tang Dynasty, wrote that Wu was thrown into panic by Chow Chow's letter. Only Zhou Yu and Lu Su refused to contemplate the idea of surrender. Against all the odds, Sun Quan and his men triumphed, the Red Cliff earning its place in history. But why? Why was the battle seasoned Chow Chow defeated by 34 year old Zhou Yu? And nor was Chow Chow a commander who relied on numerical superiority. He had won the Battle of Guandu against the odds. What's more, he'd made meticulous preparations for this southern expedition. With overwhelming superiority, he'd taken Jing Zhou without much fight. No wonder he gambled that Wu State would cave in at the sight of his letter. So what was the reason for Chow Chow's failure? Tongchang,我们认为是两个原因,就是说,呃,曹操的这个将士啊,到了我们南方这个地方,水土不服,出现了一些疾病,呃,然后呢,他的,就是说,呃,他的军队, 是以骑兵、步兵为主的这个军队，就说不适应我们这个这一带的这个沼泽地带啊，包括江湖地带的这种水战。曹操的水军实力并不强大，所以说他把这个船连在了一起，给敌人敌人以可乘之机。他的长处
Ulin is now a small town in Honghu, Hubei province. Obscure for centuries, it would be known to the wider world to this very day were it not for the scattered relics of Chao Chao's army in Chao Tan village. And of course, there was the fire that took hold here in that thrilling battle. Maybe it was the big fire that made the grass grow so densely along the river in Ulin, a lasting memorial to that great conflagration. The big fire dyed red the river and the rocks opposite Ulin. The Battle of Red Cliff not only immortalized Zhou Yu and Zhu Liang, but also made this rock famous. Later, generations carved two characters meaning Red Cliff on it. In 1998, Puqi, city of Hubei province, where the Red Cliff was located, was renamed as Chubi City. Chubi means the Red Cliff. Every morning, the scenic spot of the ancient battlefield of Red Cliff welcomes tourists from all directions. Throughout the ages, countless men of letters have come here to visit the Red Cliff, to mourn Zhou Yu, and to praise Zhuge Liang. Hundreds of battles took place in the history of the Three Kingdoms. But few have received the attention that the Battle of the Red Cliff has, the theme of countless poems and other works of literature. Why is this battle considered so important? Chao Chao was undoubtedly the biggest loser in the battle. After this battle and for the rest of his life, he was never quite the same again. No longer able to fight the state of Wu on two fronts, to the west and to the east, he'd blown his best chance of unifying the country. The greatest beneficiary was Liu Bei. After years of fruitless effort, he had at last a foothold on the other side of the river. And what a foothold. Jingzhou, a place that combined prosperity and strategic importance, the first vital step in Zhuge Liang's strategy of capturing Jingzhou and Yizhou and forming a united front to resist Chao Chao. After this battle, Liu Bei and Sun Quan had more land and were stronger than ever. With their alliance, balance was achieved between the three states. The Battle of the Red Cliff was a watershed moment in the Three Kingdoms era, a decisive battle that determined the future course of events. Before the battle, warlords contended for territories, tearing the country apart. After the battle, Wei, Shu, and Wu were able to coexist. From Tang Song, the story of the Red Cliff is very interesting. For example, the most famous one is the Red Cliff of Chen Lifu. 到了宋元，我们的金代的院本呐、啊，我们原来的杂剧就把这一段历史分呃战火纷飞的历史啊，就搬上了我们的舞台了。到了明清时期，随着我们的戏曲、地方戏曲传奇，地方戏曲像花布，包括我们后来的京剧、川剧、越剧等等，很多关于三国的故事都搬上了舞台。但是真正影响最大的，应该说还是罗贯中的《三国演义》。Of all the episodes and incidents described in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the Battle of the Red Cliff is undoubtedly the most fascinating. In Luo Guanzhong's version of the story, Zhuge Liang fabricated Ode to the Tong Chui Tai Terrace to goad Zhou Yu, and Zheng Gan stole a fake letter of surrender and fell into Zhou's trap. Among other exciting iconic incidents, Huang Gai pretended to surrender and used the trick of having himself tortured to win the confidence of Chao Chao, while Pang Tong used a set of interlocking stratagems 
not to mention Juke Liang's borrowed arrows with thatched boats, and Zhou Yu setting fire to the Red Cliff. In short, it's a tale packed with excitement and brilliant ideas, one truly deserving of its classic status. Zhuge In history, Zhou Yu was the military commander of the Allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei in the Battle of the Red Cliff. As such, he was in command in that famous Against the Odds victory. But in Luo Guanzhong's version of the story, Zhuge Liang is given the leading role. In the novel, it is Zhuge Liang who eloquently argued with advisors of the Wu state, used the enemy's arrows against them, and exploited the potential of thatched boats and the east wind to the fullest possible extent. Zhou Yu's contributions were completely overlooked. Even the use of the east wind, the key factor resulting in victory in the Battle of the Red Cliff, was attributed to Zhuge Liang. While Ulin is on the north bank of the Yangtze, the Red Cliff stands on the south bank, the river flowing from southwest to northeast in this section. As it was winter and therefore windy, using fire to attack Ulin was very risky. They would more than likely get burnt themselves. So the only chance to succeed in burning Ulin was to take advantage of a southeasterly wind when the north wind was prevalent. As Tu Mu, a poet of the late Tang Dynasty, wrote, had the east wind refused General Zhou Yu the favor, the two beautiful sisters of the Chao family would have been locked up in the Tong Chua Tai Terrace, entertaining Chao Chao, Zhou's implacable foe. There's no doubt that Du Mu's poem inspired Luo Guanchong. In Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it's Zhuge Liang who made full use of the east wind. On the day of the decisive battle, Zhuge Liang made his way to the altar. Late at night, Zhou Yu suddenly heard the sound of the blowing wind and the fluttering banner. When he left his camp, he noticed the fringes of the banners fluttering towards the northwest. Then, all of a sudden, a southeasterly wind rose up. Borrowing the east wind is just a fiction, a story. But in Chinese, it's become an idiom, indicating that everything is ready and all that we need to do is wait for the east wind. So where on earth did this indispensable southeast wind come from? <laughs> So 湖面的水温高，热空气往上升，地面的风就吹向湖面。这个叫陆风，这个陆风的方向正是周瑜他们战斗所需要的东南风。
In Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Luo Guanzhong did not attribute the greater part of the credit for burning Wu Lin to Zhou Yu, who had a lot of knowledge about astronomy and geography. In the novel, it was Zhu Liang's use of magic arts that harnessed the power of the East Wind. More than that, Lu Guanzhong characterized Zhou Yu as a narrow-minded and jealous person who was so malicious that he wanted to kill Zhu Liang. Louis Cha, a famous writer, also had complaints about this. In his conversation with Japanese writer Aikida Daisaku, he said, Luo Guanzhong's preference for the Shu state was excessive. Luo, from Taiyuan, Shanxi province, was particularly partial to this fellow townsman Guan Yu, the senior general of Shu. It's all right for him to deprecate Chao Chao, he wrote, but he even managed to deprecate the characters of the Wu state. As I get older, I refuse to accept this. Sun Jian, Sun Tu, and Sun Chuan are my fellow townsmen, and they were from Fu Yang, Zhuojiang province. I even thought about writing a romance of the Three Kingdoms from the perspective of the Wu state. Of course, the protagonists would be Zhou Yu and Lu Xun. In 200, 18-year-old Sun Quan took over the hard-won territory gained by his father and brother and became ruler. But at so tender an age, he naturally lacked authority. It was also a time when the state of Wu was beset with troubles, both internally and externally. As one of the founders of the Wu state, Zhou Yu tried his best to assist Sun Quan, otherwise Sun Quan's status would be threatened. Eight years later, Chao Chao led his army south of the Yangtze River. Although Sun Quan had conquered areas south of the Yangtze River and defeated his old enemy Huang Zhu before, he had never dealt with the top warlords. It was also Zhou Yu who persuaded a hesitant Sun Quan to resist Chao Chao. Zhou Yu rose to fame because of the victory in the Battle of the Red Cliff. After that, he sought to conquer the Shu state in the west and the Wei state in the north. Unfortunately, he passed away in Baqiu at the age of 36. On hearing his death in Wu Prefecture, Sun Quan was deeply saddened. He said Zhou Yu was able to assist the ruler now that he passed away at such a young age. And who else can I rely on in the future? The great river eastward flows. With its waves are gone all those gallant heroes of bygone years. West of the ancient fortress appears the Red Cliff. Here, General Zhou won his early fame when the three kingdoms were all in flame. These are the words of a famous poem written by Suo Dongpo, a literary giant of the Song Dynasty, who lived 800 years after the events he described. The poem was written when Su lived in Huangzhou. During the four years he spent here, he developed a special attachment to the Red Cliff, 
writing a number of poems inspired by it, including First Ode on the Red Cliff and Second Ode on the Red Cliff, as well as Charm of a Maiden Singer, Memories of the Past at Red Cliff. Some argue that Suo Dung Po's literary elevated the Red Cliff to iconic status. Without him, it might well have remained a cold, lifeless rock in the Yangtze River. I fancy General Zhou at the height of his success, with a plume fan in hand, in a silk hood, so brave and bright, laughing and jesting with his bride so fair, while enemy ships were destroyed as planned, like castles in the air. As a poet, Suo Dung Po was sentimental. In his poem, Zhou Yu is portrayed as a handsome, heroic figure, just married to Xiao Chao, a famous beauty. Zhou Yu's tomb is in Lujiang County, Anhui Province. Legend has it that when he died, Zhou Yu's body was taken back to his hometown for burial. Here, Xiao Chiao remained, devotedly guarding his tomb until the end of her days. Unfortunately, this sad and beautiful episode does not feature in Luo Guanchong's version of the story. Maybe he felt that it would detract from his central theme, a fierce, cruel battle won by guile and cunning. In 221, Sun Quan moved his capital from Gong An to Erxian County, which is today's Urzhou, Hubei Province. The county was first established in the Qin Dynasty. Under Sun Quan's rule, Erxian County was renamed as Wu Chang, which incidentally means to achieve prosperity through armed forces. From then on, Wu Chang was not only the seat of the prefecture government, but also the capital of the Wu state, as well as the political, military, and cultural center of regions south of the Yangtze River. In 229, Sun Quan proclaimed himself the emperor in Wu Chang. By then, over 20 years had passed since the Battle of the Red Cliff. Zhou Yu and Lu Su, who had strongly advised him to resist Chao Chao, were dead. Sun Quan didn't forget the great contributions they had made, and he attributed his success to Zhou Yu. As he reminded his ministers, without Zhou Yu, how could I possibly be the emperor? Lu Su foresaw this long ago. He really was an insightful man. But of all the characters of the Wu state in fiction and drama, Lu Su is the one whose portrayal is the most unfair. Though shown to be kind-hearted, honest, and loyal, he's also depicted as lacking intelligence. For example, in battles of wits between Zhou Yu and Zhu Ge Liang, he's often on the receiving end, the foil that highlights their brilliance. As such, he's come to be seen as something of a non-entity, the yes-man, the fence straddler who doesn't want to offend anyone. It's strange that Lu Su ended up with this reputation. As historian Zhu Xiu Sha remarked, Lu Su knew politics, military affairs, and diplomacy very well. He was no fool. As one of the state of Wu's most talented men, he was one of the few who really deserved high office. Lu Su with Sun Quan Bao
In the Battle of the Red Cliff, the Allied forces of Sun Quan and Liu Bei defeated the powerful Chao Chao. The success of the military campaign was naturally attributed to Zhou Yu, but much of the credit should have gone to Lu Su. Without Lu Su's idea of forming an alliance with Liu Bei to fight against Chao Chao, the battle wouldn't have taken place at all. But for Lu Su's wise counsel, it's even possible that Sun Quan would have been persuaded by Chang Chao and other advisors to surrender to Chao Chao. Luckily, Sun Quan was convinced that there were good reasons to carry on the fight, that political superiority could be transformed in military advantage. The alliance with Liu Bei undoubtedly brought great benefits to the state of Wu. Lu Su had a clearer understanding of this than anyone else. He knew there was no way Wu could stand up to Chao Chao on its own. After the Battle of the Red Cliff, Liu Bei wanted to borrow Qing Chou to pacify his people. Zhou Yu suggested detaining Liu Bei using a honey trap, while Lu Su believed that giving Jing Zhou to Liu Bei created not only a strong opponent for Chao Chao, but also a safe barrier for the Wu state. Only Chao Chao and Lu Su had the same opinion on this issue. Tingzhou Though Lu Su was not as good as Zhou Yu, Lu Meng, Lu Xun, and other famous generals when it came to commanding an army in battle, when it came to strategy, Lu Su was infinitely superior to them. He was a great politician, almost on par with Zhuge Liang himself. Unfortunately, nine years after the Battle of the Red Cliff, Lu Su aged just 46, passed away. His death was a great loss for Sun Quan and Liu Bei. If he hadn't died, much tragedy might have been avoided. Had he lived, hard to see Lu Meng betraying the alliance and killing Guan Yu. Fortunately, the Wu state had a galaxy of talents and Sun Quan was good at discovering able people and putting them in suitable positions. No more so than the general appointed to take command in the Battle of the Red Cliff, Zhou Yu. But his talent spotting ability was as strong in the Battle of Jingzhou when he put Lu Meng in charge. Later, in the Battle of Yiling, he cannily chose Lu Xun to defeat Liu Bei. These three battles are related to the rise and decline of the Wu state. Were it not for these victories, Wu would have ceased to exist. Sun Quan was confident that he would win because he was sure of his ability to identify talent and deploy in the right situation at the right moment. Sun Quan's ability was noticed at an early age. Taking command of the state of Wu, at the tender age of 18, his brother, Sun Tu, said to him, You're not as good as me when it comes to fighting, but when it comes to choosing the right people, you are better than me. That's why some scholars argue that we shouldn't see Sun Quan's success as something that depended on just one or two outstanding people. Sun Quan actually had a whole, very well-organized pool of talent to draw from. This was something that the state of Shu did not have.
Thanks to this bank of talent, Wu was able to successfully defeat Cao Cao, Guan Yu, and Liu Bei, the most prominent figures of the Three Kingdoms era. While the other states foundered, Wu clung on, becoming the longest surviving of the three states. All because Sun Quan always appointed people according to their abilities and made full use of their talents. Sun Quan, this person, I think, in the three kingdoms, can be the second person, the second person, the second person. I think the order should be like this: Cao Cao, Sun Quan, Zhuge Liang, Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and the other one should be in front of him. In 229, Sun Quan moved the capital to Mo Ling shortly after proclaiming himself emperor in Wu Chang and renamed Mo Ling as Jian Ye, which is today's Nanjing. He built another famous city here. Because a rock protruding from the city wall has a grimace like fissure running through it, it's been nicknamed Grimace City. With this as his base, Sun Quan probed the lands south of the Yangtze, becoming the first ruler to venture this far south since the days of Emperor Qin Shu Huang centuries before. It is said that he personally used the bullocks from his own carriage to demonstrate how these wastelands could be transformed into productive farms. But the state of Wu also became powerful on water, Advancing ever southward, the sea proved no barrier to Wu expansion, a Wu fleet becoming the first to reach Taiwan, other expeditions reaching the Liaodong Peninsula in the north and the coasts of Southeast Asia. Thanks to Sun Quan and his generals, Wu grew bigger than Shu, becoming strong enough to compete with Wei. This the Jintian In the summer of 252, Sun Quan died in Jianye and was buried at the southern foot of Zhongshan Mountain. During his 71 years of life, he had been in power for 52 years and was the longest serving ruler in the history of the Three Kingdoms. Today, only one tablet from Sun Quan's tomb remains and his burial mound has completely disappeared. Hero that he was in his lifetime, by the Song Dynasty, he was already falling into obscurity. The poet Liu Kuzhuang ruefully remarking that people had already forgotten who had developed Zhen Dong. Guo Shan Stel is located in Zhuangzhou Town, Jiangsu Province. After an earthquake in 276, a 30 meter long stone chamber was discovered in Li Mo Mountain in which a large stone stood. Sun Hao, then ruler of the Wu state, regarded it as a sign of auspiciousness. He renamed Li Mo Mountain, Guo Shan Mountain, and set up a monument. It still stands today, a rare surviving example of a three kingdom stone inscription. Sun Hao, the ruler who set up the steel, was Sun Quan's grandson, 
the fourth emperor of the state of Wu. But for him, the discovery of the tomb was anything but auspicious. Three years later, his army would be defeated by the forces of the Western Jin, bringing the Three Kingdoms period, with all its tales of heroes and daring do, to an end.